really going to be beneficial for the state of Florida. Betting on Florida. Only to create tens of thousands of jobs, billions in economic impact. A new gambling compact heads for debate and a vote. When government has reckless spending, we see inflation. Rick Scott tees off spending, cybersecurity, and more. Government should not be paying you not to work. In our sit down with the senator. What our community wants is greater safety. Stopping the shooting. The zip code and the neighborhood where you live should not determine your safety. Another new plan. We're going to do it in a constitutionally lawful manner. We just gave someone almost a million dollars. Costly farewell. His honesty, his integrity, his sheer hard work. A superintendent's expensive exit. If we had continued to 2023, which was the first offer of Mr. Runcie's attorney yesterday, we would have been looking at about $2 million. It's the big news of the week this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putnam. I'm Glenna Milberg, packed hour ahead, and we begin with Florida Senator Rick Scott this week doing what he did as governor, fighting government spending. Scott wants to extend and extended unemployment and President Biden's jobs and infrastructure plan. The news of the week, though, was our focus when we went one on one late this week, starting with President Biden's executive order on cybersecurity after the pipeline shut down and how U.S. infrastructure could be so vulnerable. How did we get to this point so vulnerable to that kind of cyber attack? Well, first off, every, we all have to understand that there, there are bad actors out there. There's people that want to take advantage of it. And sometimes they're, they're government actors, sometimes they're not. And every, everybody's got to take this seriously. Uh, privacy, is a, uh, privacy is important. Making sure your system can't get hacked is important. Um, and you know, making sure that our, our significant adversaries like Russia and Communist China and Iran and Cuba, uh, North Korea, I mean, they We've got to hold them accountable and we can't let them into our system. I mean, I mean the Biden administration's already, since he came in, has said that, that we can buy things from communist China for our electric grid. I mean, does that make any sense? Well, I mean, the, this just have, doesn't make sense. You, you sit on, on Homeland Security. Can you give us any intel on and how it's gotten to this point? I mean, I think it's just a lack of, of focus. I mean, the, it, there's, I'm on I'm on I'm on Homeland Security and I'm on Armed Services, two areas where we have plenty of discussions and about what's happening in with cybersecurity. And Americans are just not focused enough. Government needs to make sure that everybody's focused. So it's um, I mean, we're we're gonna see more and more of this if we're if we're if we're not focused on this. And when it happens, we gotta be all hands on deck. It's like a hurricane. So like if you're short of fuel, you got to get all hands on deck. How do we get more fuel in here? How do we get people better information? I do believe that one thing I've been frustrated with, with it, government at all levels, and I, I struggled to make sure this happened when I was governor, is always making sure people had good information. People are pretty smart if you give them good information, but if you, if you put out no information, then people don't know what to do. You know, that, that's an interesting point because in South Florida, South Florida was practically speaking unaffected by the attack and the lack of, of gas flow. Uh, and yet people didn't know that. And there was this huge run on gas because of some misinformation or disinformation. But I, I'm not sure, I don't want to put you on the spot if you haven't read that executive order. But generally speaking, it just lays out a, a lot of different standards. And a headline is, many more partnerships and closer partnerships between the government and private business when it comes to standards of software and cybersecurity. Uh, you are a business guy. That's your thing. How, how do you hear that? Well, first off, as a business person, it's your responsibility to make sure your system can't get hacked. Um, now, government ought to be helpful to you. They ought to make it you know, they, they ought to make it easy for you not use easy for you to do this. I don't believe as a general rule, government standards work because what happens is the government's way too slow. You know, you it's you as a business person, you've got to figure out how to make sure your systems are unhacked. Now, when it happens, government can be part of it. They can help go after the uh, the bad actors. They can get people good information so they can make good informed decisions. But you are responsible in your business to make sure your system can't get hacked. I. I, but let's remember, 
Communist China has decided to be our adversary. They should not be part of any part of our, our grid. They should not be part of our delivery of fuel. They should not be part of our electrical grid. They should not be part of anything like this. Nothing. Russia shouldn't. I, the Iran shouldn't. So the, you know, we, we have to all wake up and understand we have real adversaries. They want to dominate us. They don't like our way of life. And I, I so, wanna, Senator, I want to I want to talk about uh, let's bring it home. I want to talk about uh, a combination of last month. We got some unexpected, uh, unexpectedly low job numbers. Um, that was kind of a temporary blow to the administration. And then coupled with this week's jump in consumer prices, uh, I've seen reports that you've done. I've watched interviews that you've done, and you're framing this as the beginning of what might be runaway inflation. Why do you think that? Well, historically, when government has reckless spending, we see inflation. Government has reckless spending. I mean, it, the amount of money that we are spending now on things that don't not, that it just doesn't make sense. Cal, we, we gave three hundred and fifty billion dollars to our states after they had no downturn in their revenues. Do you think any of that's going to get wasted? I mean, that's the taxpayers' money. Well, you know, Flor I mean, Florida got a, a good chunk of that change. That's allowed the, the session, state legislative session, just finished, and and that chunk of money before and what's coming allowed the legislature to do a lot of things fill a lot of holes, give bonuses to first responders and teachers. But but what I wanted to ask you is in, in this in this moment, there, you know, might there be other um, factors at play? Like to your point, like the stimulus, there's a lot of money in the economy now. People are so anxious to start spending normally again. There is some bottlenecks in the supply chains. So so might it, it be, you know, as simple as uh, supply and demand economics and might this be a temporary situation? Well, first off, as we know, it's always, uh, I'm a business guy, it's always supply and demand. Uh, first off, government should not be paying you not to work. I mean, I said this last year when, when the CARES Act was passed, I tried to stop paying people more not to work than to work. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, at all, I've been talking to the you know, Federal Department of Labor. It's, it's the law that when you are off, if you, you don't get paid if you have a job, you don't get to quit and go on unemployment. Uh, so that needs to be enforced. Uh, all across the country, um, the it's it's causing all these things. You can't get enough workers. It's causing bottlenecks. It causes prices to come up. Um, but but on top of that, reckless spending cause is always it forever. Reckless spending has always caused inflation. See. And so you saw the CPI numbers up over four percent. Producer price index today over six percent. I mean, a poor family like mine growing up will have it will have a hard time making ends meet. You know, there's such a, we do, you know, you've been with us on this program. We interview the newsmakers from both parties. And there is and, and always has been such a difference in philosophy and taxing and spending. And we see that playing out now. Might, though, this be a time unprecedented po uh, coming out of a pandemic? Might this be a time to to sort of try this, something new, compromise a little bit and, and see whether this primes the pump, is there any appetite for that at all? I mean, Glenna, we have, I mean, do you realize how much money we've spent? I mean, the federal government only collects three and a half trillion dollars a year. We had the best economy in, in our history and we were still running deficits before COVID. And since then we've, we've, we've committed over six trillion dollars. I, we, now they want to spend another four trillion dollars. I mean, Who's going to pay for this? I mean, I, I don't know who I don't know who they think is going to pay for this. You know, they say they're only going to raise taxes on people making over four hundred thousand dollars a year. Do you realize they've already raised the taxes on people making like the Uber drivers and DoorDash drivers in their first bill? This this so-called COVID bill had nothing to do with COVID. And now, if you look at their spending, you you will have to raise. I think for somebody making more than a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're going to have to raise your taxes. Something like eight thousand, nine thousand dollars a year. Well, to, that's to, yeah. Again, that philosophical difference. I mean, I think a, a lot of your opponents would point to the Trump tax cuts in 2017 that didn't really touch any of 
the 70 corporations that are paying zero tax because of loopholes. So that's, that's a whole conversation and that philosophical divide for sure. Before I run out of time with you, I want to talk about just a couple of different things. I know um, you and I were in Israel on the same trip a few years ago when the embassy was moved to Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was recognized as a capital by President Trump. Um, such a, a different, again, philosophy between administrations. And now we're watching uh, something riveting South Florida right now, just this escalation and violence between Israel and the Palestinians. And, and this, it's a complicated dynamic for sure. Uh, it seems like Hamas is really capitalizing on what started as these protests over the settlements. I, I want to get your, um, your sort of perspective on how you see in this moment what has been such a, a chronic and transigent issue now with a, a very new dynamic and a new administration coming in. Let's call it by one person, Joe Biden. I mean, here's a guy that is trying to go back uh, to uh, work with Iran when they're the biggest state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, they're the biggest sponsor of Hamas and Hezbollah. All right. And he wants to go back and do somehow do business with them. All right. With no standards. He's he's even though the Palestinians, you know, have you know, they don't they don't work with Israel to try to try to make something happen. He wants to give them money. I mean, that's why this is happening. This is this is I mean, everybody knows that Joe Biden's weak. He's going to be weak on foreign policy. He doesn't care about human rights. He's not going to hold Iran accountable. He's not going to hold Palestinians accountable, Hamas, Hezbollah, communist China. So this is why this is happening. So your heart, my heart goes out to the people of Israel because they're going to, they're our biggest, uh, probably our biggest ally in the world almost. And and we got, they know that Joe Biden won't stand up to defend him. So the uh, President Biden, um, either late this week, had communicated to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and I want to quote here, unwavering support for Israel and the right to defend itself uh, sent a diplomat to honcho some sort of uh, beginning of a negotiation for ceasefire. Um, this, this dynamic now that the capital is recognized as Jerusalem by the United States, that the embassy is in Jerusalem, that the Trump administration had actually uh, been able to forge some new relationships and compacts with United Arab Emirates um, states that had not been in place before. Do you see that as maybe a framework for something different to occur? First of all, I, I'm appreciative of exactly what uh, President Trump did with the Abraham Accords, and that, that was it's historic. But let's look at what's going on. Joe Biden will say, "Oh, I care about Israel, but your biggest opponent, your biggest adversary, who wants to demolish you, he yells death to Israel." I'm going to I'm going to go work with them or the Palestinians who who don't want to work with Israel. Oh, let me go give you some money. I mean, so I mean, first off, has Biden called on called on Hamas? Has he he, he called them for what they are? Has he done anything about Hezbollah? I mean, look, well, at those, this those are those are on state sponsored terror lists. So I, I am being told that my time is up with you, Senator, and I always value your time and I hope you will come back soon and visit us. Um, because we have a lot more to talk about. So thank you so much. Hi, Glenda. Take care. Take care. And up next, masks coming off, COVID numbers down, gun violence up. A lot on the plate of Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, and she's going to join us next. Daniela Levine Cava has been the Miami-Dade mayor for barely six months, and for her and for us, it has been a whirlwind. Just this week, confronted with a seismic change in masking rules, a cruise industry dilemma, and a frightening spate of gun violence. So, as we say, she's got a lot on her plate, but Daniela Levine Cava has made time for us this morning. You see her there. Madam Mayor, good morning. Great to see you. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you both. Thank you. All right. Let's begin, if we can, with mask and masking, as the CDC announced later this week. And then you announced uh, masks are no longer required in most Dade County buildings. But on the other hand, as you also pointed out, if you're on uh, a metro bus, if you're on the metro rail, uh, you know, in a public place, I guess at MIA as well, you, you should wear a mask. So go through what is mandatory and what is voluntary with masks. First of all, let us say congratulations to our community that has really stepped up. 
we're over 55% vaccinated over age 16 and 82% of those over 65. So we've really done our part to create community immunity. Talking with Dr. Page, our chief medical uh, officer and our panel of experts, we decided with the positivity rate down and the high percentage of vaccinated people that it was safe to go ahead and remove those restrictions in county facilities. But federal government still says transportation hubs, airports, uh, public transit, those areas should still uh, have the masking. And we also want to recommend that people uh, feel uh, that they, we don't know who is vaccinated and who is not. And the guidelines are for those unvaccinated people to remove their masks. So uh, it's it's just a matter of courtesy. Uh, if you're unsure, wear the mask. And certainly in areas where you're in close proximity with lots of people, it's wise to wear the mask. So Mayor, I'm, I'm listening to you and the subtext is something that you've been dealing with from the get go. And that is there are mixed messages. Really, these mm -hmm. the new CDC guidelines came about in a flash two weeks earlier. Everybody was supposed to stay masked and socially distant. You've been dealing with mixed messaging because at the state level, the governor had taken away all mask mandates and the consequences that the local governments mm -hmm. tried to. So so what what is oh, still in mixed messaging? You know, what yes. is your how do you make a clear message to people who are now on the honor system? <laughs> Correct. I think the important thing to note is that we still have a pandemic. There are still variants that are coming forward, new ones. There are still those ineligible to be vaccinated, children under 12. There are still uh, almost half the population not vaccinated. So we cannot uh, be complacent. We the, the, the message, unfortunately, should not be, okay, we're back to normal. We're not yet back to normal. So we want to just be respectful, courteous, considerate, uh, recognizing that uh, people out there may still not be protected. And uh, we want to do our part to make sure that people get vaccinated. Truly, yeah. the path forward is vaccination. Yeah, well, we, we would like to note and with sorrow note, as you indeed have in the past, 6,200 of our friends, neighbors in Miami-Dade County have died because of COVID-19. Well, nearly a half a million we're sick with it, so it is. it still remains a huge problem. Mayor, let me ask you about cruise ships. Uh, it's a huge yes. part of the South Florida economy. You have been encouraging ways to get the cruise ships back out to work, uh, uh, sailing you know, with the passengers. Uh, where does that stand? We have been doubling down on vaccinating our crew members. We've done a couple thousand already. We've been at the port. Really, we're everywhere. We're pop-up in malls, uh, schools, starting this week, uh, we'll be uh, in downtown Miami and uh, an office building. Just wherever people gather, we are making sure the vaccine is available. And our cruise companies are prepared to make sure that their crew and passengers are vaccinated. The, the fact that the passing, uh, vaccine passport is not allowed in Florida should not preclude cruise ships from keeping their passengers safe and crew because they are offshore companies. They are registered overseas. They're going to foreign ports. Uh, they're safely sailing around the world using these protocols. And they have indicated a willingness uh, to move forward and, and a couple have submitted plans and we stand with them. So the fact that Norwegian had threatened to pull out because of that inability to mandate uh, vaccine passports, w w is that just a sort of political move putting it out there in the public or behind the scenes when you speak with them? Is, is that a yeah. legitimate threat? Well, I'm calling it a high stakes game of chicken because <laughs> I'm sure the governor does not want to be the one responsible for losing our cruising industry. It is a huge part of our economy here in South Florida, the whole state really. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that we're going to find that path forward and recognize that this is offshore business that the cruise companies are doing what the CDC, the federal agency, uh, is requiring uh, and, and that we can move forward. In the meantime, these companies are sailing from other ports. So the question is, will that be a temporary move or a long-term move? Yeah. Um, Mayor Levine Kava, let's talk about gun violence. Uh, for years, it has been at epidemic levels in Miami-Dade County, but it seems to have been a terrible 
uh, increased a surge in gun violence, particularly involving young people over yes. the last several months. It's up 11 percent, I believe, just so far through May over what it was last year. And you have announced a new plan to address gun violence, particularly uh, in about four or five zip codes. What is your plan? How are you going to pay for it? Look, uh, violence is up, like you say, across the country. Uh, unfortunately, this pandemic has created conditions that have led to more violence. And uh, we can't tolerate it. We must work together on the prevention side, as well as finding those who are perpetrating the violence. So I come from a social work background. You know, I'm a public interest lawyer and social worker, and I've spent a lifetime trying to make sure that children had opportunities for a better life. And so fortunately with the FTX naming of the arena comes $90 million over 19 years. And with the leadership of the commission, Commissioner Hardiman was the uh, original architect of moving forward with an anti-violence and anti-poverty program, we've put together the Peace and Prosperity Plan. And this will address first and foremost our young people, those at high risk of a violent lifestyle, and move them into jobs and life skill training. We're, we're really excited to move forward with it this, this year. It's proven program to reduce violence, uh, fit to lead, and our summer yeah. uh, internship programs, and hopefully the board will be moving forward. Mayor, to we were, while you were speaking, we were looking at a press conference, video from a press conference that you were there, Miami's police chief. You were announcing this five zip code, uh, and they were announcing five zip codes in Miami for an intensive police presence, 130 extra officers and manpower. Uh, and briefly, that's been done a couple of years ago in the uh, Miami-Dade Public Housing, Liberty Square, e exactly that sort of mm -hmm. operation was targeted. Uh, definitely a short-term game, no doubt, but a long-term gain, I I'm not sure that the county has seen uh, a, a long-term effect of that. So, so why now is this new effort, do you think, gonna make a difference in the long-term? So, of course, that's the city of Miami targeting zip codes, and we stand uh, by their side. And Freddie Ramirez, our police director, and our chief of public safety, J.D. Patterson, we were all there uh, to support. Uh, and what we're adding with the peace and prosperity component is the prevention component, because people need to identify those that they know are perpetrating this violence. And we know some are reluctant. So we have to really be in the neighborhoods. We need more community policing. We need to establish better um, communication and trust with law enforcement. As well, we do need to have options and alternatives. Yeah, for it, the it, Mayor, excuse me, in the minute or so we have left, I just have to say, here you've got $10 million from the uh, FTX people who are you know, going to be the arena, the new arena name. Uh, how do you measure success here? What is the criteria? What is the standard? How do you know that the millions you're spending, you know, is having an impact? Yes, uh, so it's 90 million over 19 years. So it will fluctuate year to year, but we are going to be using evidence-based programming. We'll have evaluation uh, analytics of the data. We're looking to reduce recidivism. We're looking to reduce shootings. We're looking to end the bleeding. Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, we and the community is with you on this effort, no doubt, and uh, we'll be following that. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Madam Thanks. Mayor. Good luck with the gun violence initiative. We need success there. Indeed. All right, well, uh, Florida lawmakers are gonna head back to Tallahassee on Monday. They're going to decide the future of gambling in the state, including sports betting on your cell phone. It's a big bet, big money at stake. What are the odds? The details of the Seminole Tribe Compact when we come back. The state legislature is going to convene tomorrow in Tallahassee for a special session on gambling. They will consider a new comeback that's already been signed by the governor and the Seminole tribe. It's got to be ratified. It outlines the biggest expansion of gambling in more than a decade for two and a half billion dollars to the state over the next five years. The tribe declined our invitation today, letting its promotional videos do the sell. And we want to let you look at some of that promotion. Amid a storm of challenge and loss, this Florida story gave rise to hope and our spirit to persevere. Unconquered resilience, surviving extinction, and poverty. 
only to create tens of thousands of jobs, billions in economic impact, and billions more for vital government services. The Seminoles have earned something irreplaceable, our trust, which is why we chose to honor it in our Constitution. The Seminoles are going all out to get approval of the compact, which is expansive, and the highlights include three new casinos at that Hard Rock facility in Hollywood, and the Indians there could also add craps and roulette to their gaming menu. The biggest change and the biggest controversy is online sports betting, and there is opposition to the compact for moral reasons, social reasons, and or economic reasons. The No Casinos group believes it violates the constitutional amendment that requires voter approval for gambling expansion. And there is John Sowinski, who is No Casinos president, live with us from the Orlando area. John, great to see you today, and thanks for being with us. John, welcome. We're, we're, we're glad to see you, and this is a return to This Week in South Florida for John, who was on this program talking about slot machines in 1994. So anyway, John, good to see you. Uh, you know, let's sort of get to the chase, cut to the chase here. Uh, a lot of people in the state already are gambling illegally, uh, and what the compact would do is set up a gaming commission, would regulate gambling, and would ensure a huge amount of money, $500 million to the state of Florida for 30 years. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that are a few, a few things. Number one is that Florida voters went to the polls in 2018 and almost 72% voted to give voters, not politicians, the final say if they're gonna be expansions of gambling in the state. And we're not talking about gambling in this compact just on tribal lands. The compact would essentially turn any cell phone into a slot machine with not just sports betting, but there's also a provision of the compact that requires the state and the tribe to negotiate to allow the tribe to allow all casino betting anywhere um, the, the cell phone exists in Florida. Uh, and the John, let me, let, me, let me just interrupt to simply say, if people could play sports bets by a cell phone, do you think that that would create a whole new magnitude of gamblers, people who are addicted to betting? Absolutely, and the, the statistics bear that out. The only mature market for this type of sports betting is in England, and what they have found there in, is that kids, almost over half of the kids have a betting app on their phone and 9% say they've betted in the last week. These are 11 to 16 year olds. And so when we legalize more gambling within a state, we also increase the amount of illegal gambling that goes on. The other thing you mentioned revenue. This is not new revenue to the state. The state's own revenue estimators say that a dollar spent gambling, whether it be at a tribal casino or on a mobile phone or device, is a dollar not spent somewhere else in the economy, at a restaurant, at a bar, at a movie theater, something else where jobs are created and taxes are paid. And so this is not new money to the state. It's cannibalized revenue from another economic sector. All right, so you, you bring up a lot of different layers. So can we just like delve into one at a time because all of them really need some scrutiny. I wanna take you back to the online sports betting. Um, that's going on now. And we know firsthand that people are on their phones placing bets. It's not legal to do, but it is being done. Uh, the, the sports bet is offshore. The money goes offshore. So sure. theoretically for countless people legalizing it in, in the state in this compact would actually bring the money home on something that's already being done. Well, the reality is that there's no study on gambling that concludes anything but where we have more legal gambling, we also have more illegal gambling. It doesn't end the illegal gambling because that'll continue to go on for sure because they can they seek better odds or kids go ahead and do it. But what happens, again, in England where they have this, one in five ads during a sporting event is for gambling. You can't have that type of pervasive uh, advertising without driving demand for both the legal product and the illegal product as well. It's like Joe Camel, but for gambling, basically. And we're not talking about just betting on the Dolphins are going to win by seven. We're talking about is the first play from scrimmage in the second half going to be a handoff or a pass? How many putts is it going to take Tiger to sink this one on this green? 
Um, yeah, you know, it's, how, it's endless. It's endless what, what yeah, getting it's remarketed, um, remarketed like Facebook does, you know, when you're thinking something that shows up. Um, and so that I, I just I don't mean to interrupt. I know it's really tough on Skype and Zoom, but we have to take a break. That's kind of our mandated rules. We're going to pick up as soon as we come back. So sit tight and thank you and stay tuned. On this Sunday, we are speaking with John Sawinski, the president of No Casinos. John, we're glad you're here. Let's talk a little about Amendment 3, 2018. 72% of Florida voters approved Amendment 3 to the Constitution, which says that casino gambling can't be expanded in Florida without voter approval. The governor and the Seminole tribe say this does not violate Amendment 3. What's your opinion? I think, frankly, it doesn't pass the sniff test. The compact relies on the illusion that if the file server that serves up the game is on tribal lands, that it doesn't matter where the better is, that the better could be anywhere in Florida. That doesn't comport with U.S. Supreme Court decisions on this matter. It doesn't comport with U.S. District Court decisions on this matter. It doesn't comport with common sense. Florida voters and the intention of Florida voters was that if any form of casino gambling is going to be legalized in the state, that it requires voter approval. And hey John, can I, um, I actually, I brought the amendment out here with me. So yep. I want to read the, that portion just so everybody is on the same page. It says, nothing shall limit the ability of the state or Native American tribes to negotiate gaming compacts pursuant to the Federal Indian Game and Re Gaming Regulatory Act, which oversees Indian gaming, for the conduct of casino gambling on tribal lands or to affect any existing gambling on tribal lands pursuant to the compacts. So I know to your point, the mobile betting, internet betting is not on tribal lands, but the server is. But do you think the intent of that clause gives the tribe the ability to do things like that without violating a, the voter mandate? It clearly does not. It clearly requires voter approval because the, the not only the phrase on tribal lands, but also the phrase pursuant to the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act does not allow states and tribes to legalize gambling on tribal lands that are not otherwise legal within the state. It's a condition of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that it first be legal within the state in order for it to fall under the compact and be legal on tribal lands. The purpose of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is to make sure that Native American tribes are not deprived of forms of gambling that are otherwise legal within that state, not to grant new forms of games that are not legal for others to play. So how the tribe got poker in the first place was that poker betting in private residences was legalized by the legislature back in the 1980s. That's how they had video lottery and video pull tab was because of the Florida lottery. It's why they have slot machines because the slot machine amendment that passed in 2004. And so this inventing out of whole cloth doesn't, is not pursuant to IGRA and the sports betting component and the and the piece, the, the full online betting, casino betting component that's in the miscellaneous section of the compact doesn't exist on tribal land. So it violates the Constitution in multiple ways. Yeah, we want to point out here before the conversation ends what Glenna said at the beginning, which is the Seminole tribe declined our invitation to have a representative here. So we are trying to make sure it's not a one-sided conversation with John Sawinski. Uh, John, what about the portability issue? Uh, Jeffrey Sofer, the owner of the Fountain Blue Hotel, owns the Big Easy Casino in Hallandale Beach. He has, at least for the last year, lobbying hard to move that license down to the Fountain Blue. The Senate president says he's against that. But what's going to happen in this session of the legislature, do you think? Well, the compact allows a door open for the portability of these permits. Um, and I know that the Senate president, we take him at his word that that's not going to happen during the special session, but there's nothing that keeps that from happening in any future session of the legislature. And the problem is that the reason that compacts exist, other than for the state to derive revenue from tribal gambling, 
is also to constrain gambling. That's one of the benefits that those who are concerned and don't want more gambling in their neighborhood or their community is that's one of the benefits of a compact is that it closes doors to expansions of gambling off the reservation. This compact opens many doors for, for gambling off the reservation. And I might point out that when voters approved those slot, the slot machine amendment in 2004 and the local referenda in Miami-Dade and Broward counties, there is a requirement in the Constitution that those slot machines be inside of right. existing paramutual not, facilities. Not in a hotel like the Fountain Blue. We understand. John Sawinski, right. great, great to speak with you. Thanks for your expertise, and we'll see... What happens in Tallahassee starting tomorrow? Great, thank you. Thanks, John. Next, a divided Broward School Board is giving its embattled superintendent a golden parachute to leave. The chair in charge of the negotiations will join us live next. Trying to find the right formula to pay off and then get rid of Broward Superintendent Robert Runcie was tricky business. Superintendent Runcie resigned as he fights a charge that he lied during grand jury testimony. The separation is complicated legally and politically. Broward School Board Chair Dr. Roslyn Osgood led those negotiations. She is here with us live. Dr. Osgood, great to see you this morning. Great to see you as well this morning, Glenna and Michael. Thank you, Dr. Osgood. Let's begin sort of with this tough job that you uh, did with the help of the Miami-Dade uh, Legal Council, the head lawyer for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. $754,900 uh, is the severance package for uh, Robert Runcie. Is that fair to him? Is it fair to the taxpayers of Broward County? Uh, the school board believes so, Michael. That $754,900 is comprised of several components. As you know, Mr. Runcie earns an annual salary of $356,201 for a 244-day contract. The amount that was agreed upon in the negotiations com was comprised of $261,840, which Mr. Runcie had already earned as of May 1st, another 90 days pay in compensation for the 90 days that the board agreed that he would continue to serve in the amount of $170,547, 20 weeks of severance pay, which is allowable by the Florida statute, that amount is $217,513. And then the remaining balance of $105,000 is for attorney fees and uh, $80,000 to go toward the Florida retirement system. Dr. Osgood, you sound like a human calculator. <laughs> and when you put it so bluntly like that, it, I, I will say, you know, there there's a line item by line item reason behind all of this. I, I just want to kind of put the headline on it that we saw this week, people were kind of shocked when they saw that number. But to your point, this is what a school district does contractually, Broward and every other school district. Uh, you know, administration makes a certain amount of money. And I don't think taxpayers are really clued in on that until something like this mm -hmm. occurs. What do you say to that? Dr. Osgood, can you hear us okay? I hear you now. You did oh, okay. go out for a moment. Okay, I'll, I'll just make that really long question really short. The, um, the, the big numbers that you're talking about were, were shocking to a lot of people, but to your point, this is a contract that you have with a, essentially a CEO that school districts everywhere do. Um, what can you tell Broward taxpayers who don't look at the numbers, let's say this never happened, they don't look at the numbers your administration makes. Well, what's that message? Well, the message is, is that all government entities operate with transparency. We meet, we have workshops, we discuss, we put information online, we share with the community all the funds that are being spent as it relates to administration, whether we are procuring human capital or products or services. And what the Broward County School Board has done is honored its contract with Mr. Robert Runcie as we do with all of our employees, continue to practice good 
fiduciary responsibility by using the funds that the people give us in the most uh, prudent way. So the negotiation with Mr. Runcie was a challenging negotiation. I'm very honored that my colleagues allowed me to serve as the chair of the school board during this time. There was a lot of thought, a lot of conversation, and I was really pleased that I could bring back something to them that I thought was fair to Mr. Runcie, an employee of the district who has served the district and had some remarkable accomplishments during that tenure. And, and I that think what really shouldn't be lost here, Dr. Osgood, is you know, this has been controversial because you have a, a shocking criminal charge against a school superintendent, but Robert Runcie is innocent until proven guilty. And, and I think a lot of people who are rightfully or wrongfully outraged about what he might have done or not done, that that is a point set match, is it not? I, I do think so as well, Glenna, but I will say to all of us, we know that when someone is indicted or charged of a crime, this country has a system in place that allows for due process. And we have to allow that system, the criminal justice system, to perform its duties and responsibilities while we continue to practice good human resource practices and implementing and the policies that we have and following those policies. It is not for us to say the outcome of Mr. Runtz's case, the grant, the jury, the courts will make those decisions at that time. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Osgood, clearly an incentive for you and for the board uh, to reach a satisfactory uh, severance agreement with Mr. Runcie is that you could not really recruit a quality person, man, woman, to come in and be the Broward school, school, school superintendent unless they had confidence that their contract would be honored in the breach as this one is. That was a factor, wasn't it? It was a major factor, Michael, because as we move forward, we're gonna need a leader for our school district. And people all over the nation are watching. They're watching how we handled this moment they're watching if the board was going to be true to the contract that it had in place. And as we look to hire the next superintendent, it'll be very interesting when we get into the numbers of what that amount is going to cost us to get somebody that's qualified and capable of continuing to move our district forward. So speaking of moving the district forward in the minute or so that we have left, Broward parents and, and taxpayers are looking at this district and wondering, what comes next? You have the superintendent has 90 days for this transition. Who, who is going to be in that seat? How are you going to do this as, as successfully as possible? You've got a host of other issues like the pandemic and coming back from mm -hmm. the masking. Uh, you've got a divided board with parents who lost and families who lost people in Parkland. W what is, does the next month and, and right up to the next school year, how, how is that going to be managed and i know that in a minute that's a tough one but i'll just <laughs> hand that to you well we'll continue to use the adaptive problem solving measure where we have workshops and we collectively discuss and share ideas and then we go to a board meeting and we vote during the democratic process of the majority vote winning we are moving very expeditiously to have an interim superintendent and a permanent superintendent but we're also taking our time and doing the due diligence and our research to make sure that we get a person that is qualified and capable of moving the district forward. So we will continue to lead as we have done through the pandemic and other crises of the school district with conversations following a process that this nation is yeah. set in place as a democracy. Dr. Roslyn Osgood, so good to have you with us today. Good luck with the search for a new superintendent. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Michael and Glenna. You're quite welcome. All right, we'll be right back. Great to be with you today. Stay online with us 24-7 at Local10.com. As always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.